Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Following the President's State of the Union address earlier this week, senior administration officials, the President and the Vice President have been answering your questions in a series of live online events. Today we're so pleased to have with us Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, who will be answering your questions in a live discussion on health care. Um, I'm Corey Shulman. I work in the Department of New Media here at the White House. And today we're joined by uh, a number of folks that are representing questions that they've been collecting from their respective audiences and websites. So I'm going to go around the table. We have Leslie Kane from Medscape, Marjorie Martin from AOL Health, uh, Robert Hess with Nurse.com nurse and Gannett Education, and Christy Hamam with WebMD. And to my right is, uh, of course, Secretary Sebelius. Um, thank you all so much for being here, and thanks to everyone that's watching at home. Uh, so the way that this is going to work is we're going to ask a number of questions that are, uh, uh, we're going to, the folks at the table are going to ask a number of questions to the secretary, and then there's also a live chat that's happening right now on Facebook. So if you go to whitehouse.gov slash live, you can click to join the chat, and I'll be scanning that over the course of this roundtable, and we'll be answering a lot of your questions as they come in. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Marjorie from AOL Health to ask the first question. Uh, Madam Secretary, um, first of all, thank you for inviting us. Uh, the response among the AOL audience has been tremendous. Uh, they are very passionate about this topic, which probably doesn't surprise you. Uh, we launched a page on Monday, and we had 2,000 questions, um, oh, wow. and seemingly in no time. We also did a poll just to try to find out what the trends were. So we got a lot of very in interesting information. The question that we got um, the most, by far, was around uh, whether Americans would achieve parity in the quality of their health care with what is perceived to be the quality that, that members like yourself in Congress are able to get. So just to, just to read one of them, um, Jack from Kansas, a state I think you know well, uh, says, as a citizen and a taxpayer, I want to know when I can have the same health care that the Congress of the United States and the Cabinet have. Well, Jack has a very good question, and I think there's uh, good news underway that um, one of the features of the Affordable Care Act, the law the president signed in March, has us building toward uh, state-based exchanges, a, a new marketplace where private companies will compete uh, around a set of benefits, and those who can't afford uh, to pay 100% of the benefit will have some tax credit help to get there. Uh, and small business owners and individuals will have some new market strength. They'll be pooled together. They don't have to join an organization or um, change jobs, but they will be included in the larger pool. In 2014, not only will Jack and his colleagues have an opportunity to a purchase coverage with those state-based exchanges, and Jax will be run out of Kansas. But that will be the coverage that members of Congress will have for themselves and their families. So it isn't sort of like it. It isn't almost like Congress. It will be the congressional plan starting in 2014. That, that's fantastic. I think that'll make a lot of these people very happy. Thank yes. you. OK, now I'm going to turn it over to Robert Hess of Nurse.com and Gannett Education. Yeah, by way of explanation, Nurse.com and Gannett Education, as well as our print magazine's counterpart, Nursing Spectrum and Nurse Week, uh, we specifically have programming for uh, RNs, the largest healthcare group in the United States. And I want to thank you in advance for answering the question I'm about to ask you. And I have to tell you that we received for this one an incredibly enthusiastic response. Great. I mean, just a ton of questions. As an administrator, I am uh, totally daily humbled by the advice and expertise of people in my department and nurses on the front line, uh, the, ex the uh, advice that they have for me as an administrator. And we noticed that in his address, the president said he was eager to hear ideas about improvements to the Affordable Care Act. Registered nurses are direct care providers who witness firsthand the day-to-day -day challenges facing caregivers and their patients Betty, an RN from Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, asked if the administration plans to seek the input of frontline nurses like her in the ongoing, ongoing discussion of the health care reform. Well, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, not only would we welcome Betty, uh, but Betty's colleagues across the country. Uh, we have some 
uh, key leaders in the Department of Health and Human Services who are nurses. So uh, Mary Wakefield, who runs our administration for um, services administration, which runs everything from the community health centers to the workforce issues, is a nurse. Marilyn Tavner, who is the deputy administrator uh, of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, is a nurse. So what Betty needs to know is, first of all, she has some uh, very key allies who are running major parts of this new program. We also have a whole host of commissions and boards and outreach opportunities, and we would love to have input from uh, those nurses who are delivering the care day in and day out, who know best how the new system, and particularly the new delivery system, how to keep people healthy in the first place, how to use uh, everything from medical home models to bundled care when folks get out of the hospital to reduce readmissions, and we look forward to having those ideas and those strategies as we make a transformation in healthcare. We're a big fan of Mary Wakefield, yeah. and we'd love to help you find those nurses. That's great. Perfect. I'm going to turn it over to Christy of WebMD. Thank you for having us here today. Um, WebMD has been actively covering and following healthcare reform legislation. We've polled our audience and they've cited healthcare as the most impactful health story of the past year. And um, we've opened up our site for questions following the President's State of the Union address. Um, I wanted to start off with a question related to a comment that the President made in his address Tuesday. Um, he said he's not willing to go back to the days when insurance companies could deny people coverage because of pre-existing conditions. Um, the topic of pre-existing conditions generated many questions. Um, Michelle Kay says, I'm being denied coverage now because of a pre-existing condition, but I thought the new law did away with that. Well, Michelle is uh, probably an adult, is uh, my guess by the question. And the way the new law is working is starting in um, 2011, health plans can no longer deny children uh, who have pre existing health conditions coverage. And that has been a long standing um, legal discrimination where uh, a family might get a plan, but the child who had a pre-existing health condition, anything from asthma to diabetes to being a cancer survivor, could be turned down and not covered under that family plan. That stops this year. Uh, what will happen in 2014, when these new exchange marketplaces are up and running, uh, and there are options for other, no company will be able to have an exclusion for adults. So it's a phased in program. Uh, but it's a critical end to what has been a practice for a long time where the people who needed coverage the most were not able to get coverage and often locked out of the marketplace. In the meantime, every state has a new high-risk insurance pool uh, up and operating thanks to the Affordable Care Act. The prices have to be the market prices, so they can't be charged 150% or 200%. Still pretty expensive coverage, but if an adult has been uninsured for six months and turned down in the market, they do have now, and this is a bridge strategy to get adults with pre-existing health conditions from 2011 to 2014, there is an additional option right now in every state in the country. Thank you. I think that's really helpful. To, I think the confusion has been around uh, what's in effect now you versus bet. 2014. You bet. Thanks. Uh, now to Leslie Kane of Medscape. Hi, I'm Leslie Kane. I'm editorial director of Medscape, and Medscape is the leading source for clinical and business information for physicians and healthcare professionals. Medscape gets more than two million physician visits per month, and I'm here with my colleague Christy Haman from our consumer site WebMD. And my question is, and thank you for having us here today. Sure. This is from a cardiologist from Kentucky. It's great that President Obama is going to look at dealing with frivolous lawsuits. How big an impact do you expect this to make on health care costs? And is it likely that he will look at capping non-economic damages or other tactics for tort reform? Well, the President has said pretty consistently that he does not support caps. Um, and so a federal program which would preempt state law, as you know, there are some states with uh, caps on various kinds of damages and there are other states that are not. So he doesn't believe that the feds should take over mm -hmm. that legal jurisdiction. At the same time, he directed us 
uh, at the Department of Health and Human Services to uh, work with uh, proposals across the country. And we right now have uh, about 13 um, programs underway where people are really gathering data on everything from um, a, a faster way to remedy uh, an injured patient to uh, making sure that we increase patient safety standards, look, gathering data on what actually works to both lower costs but improve patient safety along the way. And I think he's in the process of developing additional proposals which he thinks can be very helpful in this in this area. It's uh, malpractice insurance rates are a tiny fraction of healthcare costs, but I think a lot of physicians also feel that there is a defensive medicine right. practice, and I, I'm not sure that anybody can quantify what that means, you know, how many tests may be uh, taken, how many strategies may be employed be, because of defensive medicine, but I think to try and eliminate that, compensate, patients increase safety standards and give doctors who are practicing the peace of mind that they, you know, they should deserve uh, as they deliver patient care is really the goal. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. I think that'll be a, you know, a great step and our readers will definitely appreciate it. Right. Uh, if you're just joining us, we have a live chat that's happening right now on Facebook. Go to whitehouse.gov slash live. I'm scanning the chat. We've got a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, this one comes from Sam Pelk. Sam says, Secretary Sebelius, prevention is the new buzzword in healthcare reform. I'm a resident in the specialty of preventative medicine, and I'm wondering what your agency is prepared to do to support an appropriate workforce to support these prevention initiatives beyond expanding primary care. Well, I think that's a, a great question. We've had a, a looming shortage, I think, of, of providers on the horizon for really decades. And uh, the first time the Recovery Act and now the Affordable Care Act are really helping us look at that pipeline. But there's no question we need certainly more primary care uh, physicians. We need more nurse practitioners and, and registered nurses. We need um, additional gerontologists and mental health professionals and a host of community health workers who actually can be very effective in um, the strategies of intervening at a much earlier stage, uh, treating people early, uh, avoiding that acute care situation. So a lot of the steps in the Affordable Care Act actually promote that workforce pipeline. We have funding to train about 16,000 additional primary care providers in the next five years. We're doubling the number of um, practitioners in the, um, the uh, health uh, service core so that in exchange for serving in an underserved area, we'll pay scholarships and help people with their um, practitioner loans, encouraging reaching into minority communities for culturally competent uh, providers, but I think training the whole host of um, workers so you have a continuum of care. It's not just uh, medical providers, but it really is community health workers and others who can be effective uh, in a medical home model, keeping people who have been dismissed from the hospital, for instance, making sure that they're filling their prescriptions, taking their medication, that often can be a very effective strategy. Great, well now I'm gonna turn it back over to Robert from nurse.com and Gannett Education. Uh, following up on the education thing, um, when I was uh, younger as a college graduate, I was a nursing assistant who went back to school to become an RN. My wife who's a physician, the two of us, we probably consumed more college credits than anyone <laughs> I know. But something that's dear to our heart and our company that we've worked with, Johnson Johnson Campaign for Nursing Future, has to do with the fact that nurses need to go back to school. Uh, the federal government projects a shortage of nurses within the next decade, but there's currently a shortage of nursing faculty available to teach the next generation of nurses. Barbara, a nursing instructor from Seattle, Washington, would like to know the administration's specific plan to alleviate the severe shortage of nursing faculty. Well, it, you can't train more nurses unless you have nursing faculty to do that training. And again, that is 
I think, part of this pipeline. There are additional funds this year that HRSA is putting out the door specifically for nursing faculty. There also is a brand new workforce commission which is about to get to work. One of the things that I think is still lacking is an accurate mapping of where the providers are going to be needed, what the specialties are in geographic location by specialty area, and then having a very strategic plan to not just educate more folks uh, of various kinds, but really match the need to the um, training that's given. So that commission has just been appointed. They hopefully will start working very soon. Um, but nursing faculty, funding more nursing faculty, encouraging more people to go back to school and get those nurses. Um, we just met recently uh, with former HHS Secretary Donna Shalala, who just led a an, um, major national study, as you are well aware, on the future of nursing. And it deals with everything from allowing providers to practice to the scope of their education, which is now restricted in, in too many states, uh, as well as dealing with the faculty issue. And we're working very closely with her on implementation steps that we can take within our administrative authority to encourage the acceleration of those, those plans. And I think that's, that's good news for the, the potential nurses that can't get into nursing school because there aren't spots because they're not faculty. You bet. So you news. bet. Thanks. Christy from WebMD. Sure. Um, we've received a lot of personal stories, um, some of them heartbreaking, frankly, from people who are facing skyrocketing premiums and they either can't afford them or they're afraid they're not going to be able to afford them in the future. Um, and so here's an example of a question Miranda in Colorado says, you know, what if premiums are too expensive? How is the new plan going to keep costs down so they're affordable? Well, it's a great question and, you know, Insurance premiums have been skyrocketing. They're up about 133% over the last decade. And in many instances, particularly employees who have employer-based coverage, often they are paying not only more, substantially more for their share of the premium, but they're paying a lot more out of pocket. A lot of expenses have been shifted, so it's a sort of double whammy. Um, two things are going on. One is, uh, again, building toward this new market, there will be uh, a more competitive marketplace, and that in and of itself will help contain costs. Uh, competition as opposed to monopolies really does help in this instance, and everyone in the new exchange will have a choice of at least two plans. And um, we also have helped to give additional resources to state insurance commissioners. Uh, insurance is regulated at the state level, uh, and in too many cases, the insurance regulator didn't have the staff, the wherewithal, the expertise to really question company rates, uh, look at the underlying data, make sure that there was a careful balance between keeping the company solvent, but also keeping people in the marketplace and that the rates were fair and justifiable. So those resources have been part of the new Affordable Care Act, a more rigorous review and already are paying dividends, so in Connecticut, um, rates that were initially submitted by the largest insurer were denied. The company came back and cut the rate request by two-thirds. Uh, in California, they, they pulled the rate altogether and came back with a much different structure. And in fact, were demonstrated to be using the wrong trend. Not only uh, was the rate almost 40% of an increase, but it was, it was the wrong trend line used by the company. So when the actuaries looked at it, they couldn't even justify. So those, those help. We also have a new website, uh, healthcare.gov, that is up and running. And um, a consumer can go on the website, uh, buy zip code, put in a little information, and for the first time ever in history, uh, get a snapshot of what is being sold in that marketplace for his or her age group and what the prices are. Um, we find that the insurance market, you can often get more information about the toaster you're going to buy than the insurance plan you're purchasing for yourselves or your family. Those days are over, and just having some transparency, lining up plans side by side, measuring rates side by side, in and of itself has begun to change 
uh, some of the marketing tactics we find that companies don't want to be the highest price plan in the marketplace. And once you can see them side by side, it's beginning to make a difference. So competition will help. I think um, uh, more rigorous rate review will help. And frankly, some of the efforts that we're going to um, get underway in terms of improving overall health care will help the underlying costs. Thank you. Sure. We've got a live conversation that's happening right now on Facebook. Uh, if you want to join the chat and ask your question for Secretary Sebelius, go to whitehouse.gov slash live. There's a link to join the Facebook chat. We just got a question that comes from Susan Keyes. Susan asks, what initiatives are planned to support the development of innovative uses of technology for promoting health? Oh, um, Susan, that's a great question. And I think um, some of these uh, groups represented around the table are already using technology uh, to um, involve consumers in their choices and in their health plans. Um, but there are lots of really exciting things, I think, on the horizon. We're right now working with Johnson & Johnson um, on a text for babies uh, to a strategy where um, pregnant women uh, are given cell phones and regular updates uh, involving prenatal care advice. Uh, you know, what should happen in the first month, what kind of vitamins, what kind of uh, information, recognizing that everybody has a cell phone and uh, that that's an easy, fast way to get information. And so far, the early results look very promising. Uh, certainly, transparency, so the kind of website that I just talked about on healthcare.gov, which has never been put together before anywhere in the country, uh, making it a lot easier for people to get information, uh, compare information. Um, I think that we have a whole series of now hospital data that's beginning to be published, so consumers will have a lot more information about not only costs, um, hospital to hospital, but what the infection rates are like, what um, kinds of outcomes there are. We're also putting together community health data, which again, I think can be very exciting. I, I'm hopeful that eventually we'll get to the point where uh, business leaders and community leaders make decisions about where to expand and grow businesses as much on health information as they do right now on test scores, because it is a, um, a significant factor for a healthy workforce. So assembling community data and actually driving some competition among city leaders saying what you want to do is have the healthiest community in America, the healthiest workforce in America. So we're really um, looking at all kinds of ways that we can be much more innovative. And, and frankly, the whole goal is patient-centered care. The more patients and consumers know about their own health care. The electronic medical record strategy is part of this, um, where there are now um, a, encouragement to doctors and hospitals to really shift from a paper file system to an electronic record system. Uh, the goal is not only to have better patient care, but to give people access to their own health information, things that they are really not able to have or monitor now. So um, there are lots of other ideas, <laughs> but technology is very much part of, I think, this new transformation of the health system. OK, now I'm going to turn it over to Marjorie from AOL Health. Madam Secretary, um, one of the most popular areas of AOL uh, is content on prevention. Uh, people are consuming it at higher and higher rates. And that is a nice segue into a question that we have from Pamela of California asking if preventive care is a focus of this plan and even further, if we would ever consider giving tax breaks to people for living in a more healthy way. Well, that's a, it's a great question. Um, one of the first steps, part of the uh, Patients' Bill of Rights initiatives that actually kicked into gear this year uh, deals with preventive care. And any health plan that is um, new and offered after uh, January 1st of this year and for all Medicare beneficiaries, no longer will there be any co-pays for a whole variety of preventive care, whether that's a mammogram and a cancer screening or a flu shot for kids or a, you know, updated pediatric visit, those are um, 
need to be encouraged and the goal really is to take down what may be a financial barrier for some to actually access uh, preventive services and Medicare beneficiaries for the first time will also not have copays associated with uh, that kind of prevention care. Um, there is a, a portion of the Affordable Care Act that recognizes that private employers have often been real leaders in prevention and wellness and so there are um, tax credits that will encourage more private companies to actually get into um, that whole uh, area to make it easier for their employees to exercise, easier for their employees to eat healthy diets. Um, we're certainly working closely with school systems and others in terms of our children's health issues. Uh, it's been really pretty alarming to look at um, not only what's often served in school cafeterias, but the lack of physical education that too often is uh, a part of the kids' curriculum. So they have become very engaged and involved, and I know a lot of moms around the country have been very much uh, part of that struggle. So right now we spend 75 cents of every health dollar dealing with chronic disease, um, much of which is preventable. And the goal really is to uh, shift to a health and wellness system and away from an acute care system. We do acute care very well in this country. We have not really had a lot of success or a lot of focus. About eight cents of every dollar is on any kind of prevention strategy. So we'd sort of like to change those incentives a bit and uh, actually encourage not only individuals but employers and others to take this very seriously. Just a quick follow-up. Um, Going from the 75 to 8, do you foresee a 50-50? Do you think that would happen in terms of the portions of the dollar going to each? Well, I'm certainly hopeful. I think that, I mean, what we know is underlying a lot of those chronic conditions are two primary factors, obesity and smoking. And the efforts uh, have been redoubled uh, to go really aggressively after tobacco use, which dropped pretty dramatically in this country and then has been frozen at about 20% among kids and adults. And we really need, if we can lower the smoking rate from 20% to 12%, that dramatically changes then health costs into the history. If we really have some success on uh, rates of obesity and can um, particularly affect the rates of children, we will have many fewer diabetics, we'll have fewer heart disease, we'll have, so the, the costs will automatically begin to balance because we won't be spending the kind of money we are right now on uh, treating chronic conditions, treating acute care. We'll have longer and healthier lifestyles and a more, more importantly for this country, I think, a much more prosperous workforce, a healthier workforce, uh, and that will be good for America. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, Leslie with Medscape. Okay, thank you. Uh, Medscape has been hearing a lot from physicians about concern over Medicare reimbursement rates. And so we have really? a yeah, sur <laughs> no surprise, I'm sure. We have a question from an internist in Colorado. It says one thing President Obama didn't mention was the sustainable growth rate and fixing the Medicare physician payment formula. A number of physicians have stopped taking Medicare and Medicaid patients because of the rates paid, how do you envision this being addressed in 2011? Well, I'm really hopeful that uh, the sustainable growth rate and the payment rate for providers in Medicare is something that really will get some bipartisan support. It's uh, totally unacceptable that we have um, 47 million Americans depending on this very important um, plan to deliver services and yet Providers don't know from week to week or month to month if they actually will be reimbursed. And the president has said from the day he got inaugurated, this is an issue that uh, is, uh, has got to be dealt with, and it has to be dealt with long term. Um, right now, we have, again, a one-year fix, uh, which at least takes us into next year. But he's very determined and has charged me as secretary to you know, reach out to members uh, of both the House and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats, and figure out a long-term fix for this issue. So doctors and nurses and other providers un understand that 
Um, we will be good payers, we will be permanent payers, and we think these services are critical uh, to the people of America. We have to fix this problem. And just to remind um, some of the listeners and viewers who might not be aware of this, this isn't a problem that arose with the Affordable Care Act. In fact, it has nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act. It dates back about 10 years to the balanced budget amendment. And unfortunately, it should have been fixed a long time ago. Congress has never really fixed it long term. It just sort of fixes it a year at a time. We need a permanent strategy uh, and a fix and a payment that is really guaranteed on into the future. Well, I think there will be a lot of cheering if that can happen. <laughs> thank you. I can hear them. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to turn it back over to Christy with WebMD. Great, thank you. Um, Secretary, when we last had the opportunity to talk, this was a question that was coming up a lot and it's still of great interest to our audience and it really deals with um, quality of care. This is from Jim R. in Texas and he says, uh, I already have insurance through my employer. I want to know how you're going to make coverage available to more people and not impact quality. Well, actually, um, I. I am very optimistic that um, we can improve quality. And uh, I know that a lot of the conversation up until now has focused on the kind of insurance market changes, which were part of the immediate changes in the Affordable Care Act, uh, particularly for those people in the individual and small group market. What I think is um, going to be a major focus um, for years going forward is looking at the kind of care that's the, the whole delivery system. Are we delivering the right care to the right patient at the right time? Uh, is going into any hospital in America going to produce a positive result? Uh, right now we have way too many hospital-based infections, for instance, and about 100,000 people a year die, not from what brought them to the hospital, but what happens to them in the hospital. We know there's strategies to make that better, but we've never really taken that to scale. We know that uh, way too many people who are released from the hospital are back in within 30 days, preventable readmission. Some of those folks have a health crisis. A lot of them just didn't get the proper follow-up care, haven't filled a prescription, haven't followed a strategy, and nobody really has checked up on them in a long term. We know we can do a lot better job on uh, how heart attack um, victims are treated initially and what can prevent the second heart attack. So there are a number of health-related goals, improving the overall health of America, um, prevention strategies we've already talked about. Uh, that will be part of the framework of the Affordable Care Act. And frankly, the Medicare and Medicaid systems, which touch every hospital, touch most providers, have a major role in improving the quality of health for all Americans, and we really intend to follow that directive. Great. Thank you. Sure. We've got about five minutes, so we'll see if we can get just a couple more questions in. Um, <laughs> complicated there, You're right. But, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can get a, uh, just a couple more in. Um, Marjorie, do you want to take the next one? I would love to. Great. Um, probably the third most popular question we had from our members at AOL is um, w was really a lot of enthusiasm for the reform plan and the idea of having coverage for everyone. And a lot of questions, I won't even attribute it to one person because we heard this a lot, is why do we have to wait till 2014? Well, it is, a, it is a good question, and I know that 2014 in some ways seems like a long um, way down the road. I can tell you for um, the teams that are coming together in every state around the country to build the new exchanges, it seems like tomorrow. So there's a, a little bit of a look. Insurance um, is a, you know, not only complex issue, but the goal is really to build a stable system in the future and to not disrupt coverage going forward. So it was really a balance of how you fix some of the features of the current marketplace that don't work very well. So changing some of the rules, getting rid of uh, all plans right now, you know, get rid of the ability of an insurance company to rescind your coverage if you've made a technical mistake. That is no longer allowed by law. All plans must offer young adults coverage on their family plan up to the age of 26. That goes into effect. The um, elimination of discrimination of children with pre-existing conditions hits right away. The elimination of um, 
a lifetime cap on policies goes in right away. And so part of it is to sort of fix some of the market strategies for the people who have insurance right now to begin to offer some bridge strategies, so the high-risk adult pool um, that wasn't in place before, and uh, some help for people uh, to get additional coverage, and building uh, some of the workforce that we're going to need to take care of the additional uh, patients, developing additional community health centers that will be available uh, throughout the country. So by the time we hit 2014 and an additional 30 to 35 million Americans have coverage options, we really have a framework that is able to deal with those folks and doesn't uh, really debilitate the system by sort of overloading it all at the same time. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to turn it over to Robert for the last question. Okay. As an enthusiastic consumer of health care myself, <laughs> and being blessed with parents in their 80s who are consuming it even My dad more. will be 90 in March, so. Rona from Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts would like to know how, given their increased numbers and life expectancies, senior citizens will be able to meet their own long-term care needs when the cost of care is still unaffordable to most of them. The long-term care needs or health care needs? Their long-term care needs. Okay, well, um, right now, as you know, the, um, the feature in the Affordable Care Act that deals with long-term care is really a new program called the CLASS Act. And what the CLASS Act anticipates is um, people being able to set aside voluntarily a portion of their income and then draw that income uh, down sort of out of their savings account in the future to buy a variety of residential care services. Uh, what we hear from people all over the country, and I certainly, you know, my parents were in this situation, um, folks aren't enthusiastic about necessarily being in a nursing home. What they want to do is age in place, have support services to live independently for as long as possible. And some folks are forced into a nursing home setting because they don't have help at home and they don't have help with daily living. So this is really a plan to provide a continuum of care and, and provide assistance for a lot more Americans as they live longer and healthier to really um, have support in a residential community setting. Well, thank you so much, Secretary, for joining us. Thanks to the readers of Medscape, AOL Health, Nurse.com, Gannett Education, and WebMD, and especially all of you that have been asking your questions and engaging in the dialogue on Facebook. If you joined us late, this video will be posted on whitehouse.gov very soon, so check back uh, and have a good afternoon. Thanks.